Welcome back, everybody, to lecture number eight. We're going to talk about viral DNA replication. The more, the merrier. As you know, just like for RNA viruses, you have to make more genomes. If you don't, you can't make more virus particles, right? So for DNA viruses, the same thing. You have to copy them. And today we're going to be talking about uh, these DNA viruses on the Baltimore scheme, the parvoviruses with single-stranded DNA. The, um, I'm not going to really talk about hepatitis B virus because uh, we'll talk about it next time uh, we talk about reverse transcription. But it is uh, one of those viruses when it's repaired, uh, then the, this double-stranded DNA has to be duplicated, of course. Uh, and then we're going to talk about adenoviruses, herpes, polyoma, and papilloma, the group seven, with double-stranded DNA. And remember, this is uh, something we talked about last time. Viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection. That's why we had transcription first uh, before this, because you need at least one protein, sometimes many, to get uh, viral DNA synthesis going. And today we're going to see uh, that one or more protein being made. So just like for RNA synthesis, there are universal rules for DNA replication. Uh, DNA, of course, is synthesized by template-directed incorporation of DNMPs into the three prime hydroxyl of the DNA chain as shown here. We use the same image for RNA. All the pr basic principles are the same. You have a uh, template, of course, uh, a primer, uh, and then the bases are added to the three prime end according to the template, of course, and the, the DNA is always synthesized in a five to three prime direction. The template is copied in a three to five prime direction, but the DNA is made in a five to three prime direction, and it is called semi-conservative replication. Uh, because we make two daughter strands. I don't know why they're daughters. It's always been called daughter strands. So here is a, is a diagram of, of semi-conservative and conservative replication, uh, to, in case you don't know it. So here in the middle is our double-stranded DNA, which has to be replicated. And semi-conservative is when you take both strands and copy them both. So both strands are copied, very straightforward. Conservative is, as you might think, only one st strand is copied. And this is not what we're talking about today. Replication begins at very specific sites. On the template, we call these origins or origins of replication. And we're gonna talk about how they work today. And DNA synthesis is catalyzed by DNA-dependent DNA polymerase and, and many other proteins. Actually, there's more than one DNA polymerase, as you will see, and there's a host of accessory proteins. And this last bullet point, uh, this is pretty much brand new. Last year was the first time I said this. I've said for years that DNA synthesis is primer-dependent. But just uh, a few years ago, we found out that some DNA synthesis is actually primer independent, it doesn't need a primer, kind of like transcription. Here's the experiment that showed primer independent DNA polymerase. Dogma overturned, right? There was a dogma. I used to say every year, DNA replication is primer dependent. And we're gonna see that today. In fact, for the polymerases we talk about, actually they are primer dependent. And that's one of the puzzles of biochemistry is where the primers come from and there, there are a number of issues associated with them that we'll address. But here is a wonderful experiment where uh, we're looking at DTMP incorporated uh, picomoles here. So you can measure incorporation of this single base with time. So you set up a, a reaction with DNA polymerase and a template. And then you ask whether or not you need a primer. So there are two different... DNA polymerases here in this experiment. Uh, one of them is T7 DNA polymerase. T7 is a bacteriophage, and it's, it encodes its own 
a DNA polymerase. We actually we saw, I believe, the structure of that um, last time. So here it is without a primer, the orange, no synthesis. And you add a primer with red, boom, you get synthesis, primer dependent DNA polymerase. And now we have another polymerase here from a bacteriophage called NRS1. And this is a bacteriophage that infects bacteria that live down at the deep sea vents, those smokers at the bottom of the ocean, right? Big piles of smoking rock for, from hot stuff coming out of the middle of the earth. All kinds of things live around it and uh, bacteria live around it. It's just amazing. And there are phages that infect these bacteria. And so, you know, those, those boats go down and sample it. And so they bring back bacteria, they bring back phages. And this one is called NRS1. For reasons I don't remember, they decided to purify the polymerase from this phage and they found it was primer independent. So here's NRS1 without a primer in blue, plenty of incorporation. And with a primer, it doesn't matter. Don't need a polymerase. Dogma overturned. So maybe this is an ancient polymerase and it uh, evolved to, to utilize primers. These are This one, this NRS1 polymerase tends to fall off the template frequently in the beginning of polymerization. It's kind of like RNA polymerase that we talked about last time. And maybe having a primer helps to lock the polymerase on. Someone asked, is this an in vitro experiment or in cell culture? This is in vitro. Purified polymerase, triphosphates, and other things you need for the reaction. The, the mechanisms of DNA synthesis are very similar to what we've talked about for RNA synthesis. In fact, the polymerases look very similar. As I told you last time, they all look like a right hand with thumb and fingers and palm domain. So here's RNA-dependent RNA polymerase at the bottom where the thumb and the fingers domains touch at the top. Uh, is a DNA polymerase. And you can see the active site in the yellow beta strands, very much like the RNA polymerase. There's a double strand DNA entering. And here the fingers and thumbs are not touching. So similar structure, architecture, and also two metal mechanism of catalysis where the, the triphosphate that is being added by the polymerase to the template uh, depends on two metals, two magnesiums that are coordinated by two aspartate residues at the active site, and that helps to catalyze the nucleophilic attack reactions that eliminates two phosphates and joins the phosphodiester bond. So very similar to what we talked about last time. DNA replication needs at least one viral protein, sometimes many, so always one has to be made. And that's why it's delayed, and it's delayed also because you have to make capsid proteins later. So you, you delay. Well, actually, the DNA synthesis is delayed because of this requirement. And so capsid protein synthesis is also delayed because you don't make capsids before you have anything to put in them. And what does the host cell provide? Well, simple viruses require more host proteins because they have smaller genomes. So those DNA viruses with small genomes, uh, they they encode one protein that they need to, uh, or that's required for DNA replication, and the rest is provided by the host. And then the bigger viruses, the big genomes can code more proteins. And as you'll see, we'll, we'll talk about them. We'll talk about viruses with small genomes that encode only one protein. And there, of course, the problem is how does one protein get the DNA replication going? Uh, and then we'll talk about viruses that encode a lot of proteins. So where does the polymerase come from? I've already told you this. The small DNA viruses don't encode the polymerase. They encode proteins, which we say orchestrate the host, have the host copy their genome. And that's not a, a simple feat. For, for one or two molecules of, D, of viral DNA to enter the nucleus, you think they're going to have, have the cell machinery pay attention to it? No, they're going to be ignored. So they have to have a way to attract the cellular machinery. That's what we mean by orchestrate. And we're going to talk about how that works today. And these include members of papillomaviridae, polyomaviridae, and parvoviridae. Now, we have talked uh, a little bit about parvoviridae and, and polyomaviridae, and we'll talk more about them. Pa papillomaviridae actually used to be 
classified together with the polyoma, but then they were separated. And these include human papillomaviruses, very, very important medically, which we will talk about more. And then the large DNA viruses encode most of their own replication systems. These include the herpes viruses, the adenoviruses, and the pox viruses. And we'll talk about examples of all of these today. So what proteins are we talking about here? We're talking about DNA polymerases and accessory proteins. And so there are, in our cells, in our eukaryotic cells, there are a number of DNA polymerases that have different functions, as you'll see. And then there are other accessory proteins that are needed. It's a complicated series of reactions. These include origin binding proteins. Remember, the origin is where DNA synthesis begins. And helicases that unwind DNA. Exonucleases to uh, cut away the primer, and also uh, enzymes that are needed to make the triphosphates. Small genomes don't encode these, but some of the larger viral genomes do, like thymidine kinase is encoded by herpes viruses, ribonucleotide reductase, DUTPase. So the triphosphates are needed, right? And so there are enzymes that make them, and uh, sometimes the viral genome encodes them. So the DNAs are, have diverse structures that have to be replicated, just like the um, RNA viruses have a diversity of structures that have to be reproduced. And here, here are them, here they're shown, the ones we're going to talk about today. We have uh, adeno-associated virus, which is a parvovirus, single-stranded DNA virus, and the SV40. So that's 4,680 base, bases. SV40, 5.2 K, KBP of double-stranded circular DNA. Then we have adenovirus, which is 35,000. So here's what I mean. These two, 4.6 and 5.2, they only encode uh, one protein, essentially, to get DNA synthesis started. And then we jump to human adenovirus and encodes its own polymerase and some other proteins too. Uh, herpes simplex virus, double-stranded linear. And then vaccinia virus, 200,000 bases, and the DNA is double-stranded, but the ends are covalently joined. So if you denatured this DNA, if you separated the strands, it would be a single-stranded circle. Now, a key to our discussion today is going to be proteins that interact with these genomes. For example, we have, uh, well, all these genomes have origins of replication, which are shown here by ORI. So here for SV40, it's right there. For adeno, it's at the ends. Herpes has a couple of ORIs. And uh, the, for, for pox, people aren't quite sure where it is, <laughs> but it begins somewhere, uh, so we don't show it here. The ORI for uh, AAV parvoviruses is uh, at this end here in the left end, as you'll see. And then we have uh, cellular replication proteins, which get, which get recruited to the ORI via these viral origin binding proteins, which are in red. They help to recruit cell replication proteins. And then some viruses encode their own replication proteins to the bigger genomes, as you see. All right, so there are two broad mechanisms of DNA synthesis, replication fork or strand displacement. All right, so let's start with the replication fork. These are the viruses that uh, reproduce their DNA, replicate their DNA in this fashion. Uh, basically, it is a fork. You have DNA synthesis on both strands, and the fork moves from right to left. It grows bigger and bigger. It starts at an origin and then grows, and we'll see how that works. Papillomas, palliomas, herpes, and retroviral proviruses. Be, you know, the retrovirus provirus, as we'll see next time, the DNA is integrated in the host genome. It's our DNA synthesis that reproduces the provirus. We'll, we'll learn more about that next time. So here we use RNA primers. Those are shown in green. So this, this is a primer-dependent enzyme. Uh, the RNA primer is laid down first, complementary to the template, of course, and then the DNA polymerase comes in and synthesizes the DNA, uh, which is shown here in a in a red and orange. They're meant to be to show you that they're complementary. Newly synthesized DNA is shown in red and orange here. On the other hand, strand displacement is different. Uh, here you have a primer. You begin at one end of the DNA and you displace the top strand here. So as the polymerase is making the product in red, the top strand is displaced. That's why it's called strand displacement. Uh, and this also requires a primer, but it is never an RNA primer as it is for the replication fork. 
that can be a protein primer or a DNA primer, never RNA primed. So strand displacement, distinct mechanism, and distinct primer. And we will talk about examples of this as well today. Uh, we'll talk about adenoviruses in which the primer is a protein and parvoviruses in which the primer is a DNA hairpin, actually. Now, when you uh, reproduce DNA, at least linear DNA, you have a problem which we call the five prime end problem. And that's illustrated here. So here we have linear double-stranded DNA such as ours in our cells. And um, if you reproduce each strand with a replication fork, you end up with two uh, copies where you had one before, two double-stranded copies. And each of these has a primer, an RNA primer here at one end, at the five prime end where synthesis began. That's in green. And you have to remove it because you have to make double-stranded DNA. You can't have bits of RNA around. So when you remove it, now you have a gap. And how can you fill it in? You can't. <laughs> you can't fill it in because if you, to fill it in by the polymerase, you'd need a primer. So you'd have to put an RNA primer on. Then you'd still have a gap. So you have an issue, right, on both of them. And so that's the five prime end problem. In our cells, it's dealt with with telomerases, which we'll talk about next time. Viruses have unique solutions to this five prime end problem. And we're going to explore that today. It's one of the things we'll look at. Much of what we understand about DNA replication in our cells and in viruses started with SV40 many years ago. Why? Because you could purify the template. 5KB template, easy to purify. You couldn't purify cellular DNA very easily. And we found there was an origin of replication in it, as shown here. So here's the viral genome double-stranded circular DNA. You can make tons of virus. You can extract the DNA and put it in a test tube and do replication reactions. And what was learned is that, here you know, we're looking at a linear version just for simplicity. DNA, begin, DNA replication begins at the origin. You get a replication fork, which goes in both directions. It's bi-directional. And so now you can see here in this bottom image, we have new strands of DNA, the red and the salmon colored, I guess. And there are, two, there are two replication forks going in either direction, but it all starts at the origin of replication. And above here is, is one experiment which proved that uh, replication is bidirectional. And this is uh, an experiment where they took SV40 DNA and they cut it with a restriction enzyme and they knew exactly where the site for the restriction enzyme is. And it cut it uh, in, in, in a way that put the origin uh, offset from one end, as you'll see in a moment. So you linearize this DNA, and then you do uh, DNA replication reactions in a test tube. And then uh, you, you at different times after your reaction begins, you look at the products in the electron microscope. So these are DNAs, these, these uh, threads here. You can stain them in the way that you can see them. And if you look at the left, that's the early time point. You can see the tiniest bubble there, right? That's the earliest <laughs> beginning of this replication fork. And then in the second panel, it's a later time point. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, it's almost the whole molecule. And this shows that it's bidirectional because we have an end to compare it with. We can see that both forks are moving. And that's the beauty of this experiment is that we can cut with a restriction enzyme. The origin is not in the middle of the DNA. It's off to one side and we can see the ends both growing. So that's the evidence for this bidirectional uh, replication fork. So here's a, a schematic of this process. Semi-discontinuous DNA synthesis from a bidirectional origin. So you know, you know what that part is, bidirectional origin. There's DNA in both directions. So we have two replication forks. But what is this semi-discontinuous? Well, because of the, the, you have to make DNA in a five prime to three prime direction and the top strand, you can go continuously in one direction. You can make five to three prime. You put down an RNA primer in green and the polymerase just keeps making a product and the fork grows. This will get denatured. And there's no issue. And on the other strand, you can do the same thing. When this fork is very small, uh, the, there are these regions uh, upstream here that have to be made in pieces. 
Now here we've already expanded the fork, so we know um, that these have to be made in pieces. But when the when the fork is small, for example, you put down a primer, and then you make the product, and then the fork gets bigger because of the leading strand on the other strand. And now what are you going to do? You have to put down another primer and fill it in, right? And then when the fork gets bigger, you have to put down. So this is discontinuous replication. And so you have two of those, two discontinuous, and that's the lagging strand. The leading strand is continuous. So that's where we get semi-discontinuous. They could have called it semi-continuous, I guess, but okay. Semi-discontinuous uh, from the origin. And then finally, there's no end problem here because it's a circle. It's going to go around and eventually, it, let's say this was the end of the circle here. This leading strand is going to continue. You're going to remove the RNA primer. It'll fill that in. All these gaps can be filled in with no problem. There is no end problem because there are no ends, right? <laughs> and that's how it works out. So that's one solution, which our chromosomes don't have, of course, because ours are not circular. Here's what an origin looks like. Um, this is on the top. Uh, the origin region. So the, the genome was 5,243 bases in length. And so the, at one point, it's both base one and 5243. And that's the origin right there. And we're expanding it down below. But before I, I go below and tell you about it, this um, region has an early promoter right next to it. So origins and promoters are often very close to each other. And uh, here's an enhancer for that early promoter. This area on the DNA is nucleosome free. If you remember, I told you SV40 is one of those rare DNA viruses where the DNA in the particle is wrapped around nucleosomes. And, but this region is free of them. And that makes sense because this is where the DNA synthetic apparatus has to bind. And if we expand this little region here, which is called the core origin, you see it has interesting elements. And in yellow, there are a whole bunch of one, two, three, four, five, six of what we are calling large T binding sites. There are two of them. And T antigen or large T, I'll mostly call it T antigen, but there's more than one, is that one protein that has to be made to get viral DNA synthesis going for this particular virus. We'll, we'll see how that works. And then we have an AT rich element. So what's with an AT rich element? Well... As you may know, AT base pairs are easier to melt than GC base pairs. And so this helps to denature this region so that the polymerase and all the other proteins can get in and start making that replication fork. So origins tend to be AT rich for that reason. And then we have a palindrome, which is a repeat that is part of this. So that's an origin of SV40. And here's what happens. So the SV40 DNA, remember, gets into the nucleus. So the virus gets in, goes all the way through the ER to the nucleus. The DNA gets in the nucleus and there it's going to be replicated. But before it can do that, it has to be transcribed, right? It goes an early, the early promoter is active. It transcribes an mRNA for T antigen. The mRNA goes out in the nucleus. T antigen is made and then T antigen comes back into the nucleus we had a nice picture of that last time. And the T antigen then binds the viral DNA. And so here is the viral DNA on the top, just part of it. Here's the minimal origin uh, with the, the palindrome and the AT rich sequence, the large T binding site. And we have large T proteins. These are these uh, rectangular wedges here. Uh, 12 of them bind around the origin, six on each side. It, that undergoes a conformational change or induces a conformational change in the DNA to help denature it. So DNA, T antigen is a helicase. It can unwind DNA. So it begins to unwind the origin. Um, and then, and that's an energy dependent reaction, as you can see here. And then large T recruits a cell protein called RPA. RPA binds T antigen directly. And it binds to the single-stranded DNA, as you can see here, of both strands uh, that has been denatured by the helicase activity of large T. So that's the very early phase of uh, DNA replication. And again, large T is needed. That's that first viral protein that's made. 
helps to denature the origin and it recruits the first of many of cellular proteins needed to reproduce this DNA. And so that's the key here, that one protein that gets DNA synthesis going. And, you know, if, this, if the DNA, this SV40 DNA just went in the nucleus and sat there, it would never be seen by the host apparatus because it would be one or a few molecules among many, many host DNAs. So the solution is to have a protein that will bind the viral DNA and recruit cellular proteins, which will enhance its chances of being reproduced. And it works because eventually uh, the, the cell reproduces this viral DNA. So now the, the subsequent steps I want to go through with you, if anything, to show you how beautiful this is. And again, you know, this was all worked out uh, with, with SV40 in vitro in a, in a test tube. And then we were able to extend it to... Uh, eukaryotic cells. So here we have that large T flanked uh, bubble with the RPA bound to both strands. Uh, then a, a f the first polymerase called, comes in called polymerase alpha primase, uh, which makes the RNA primers on this single strand, on both strands, of course. And it will also make short DNA fragments. So here we have uh, Paul alpha primase coming in there and start to synthesize the uh, RNA primer. And then the red is the DNA. And then some other cellular proteins come in, RFC and, and PCNA, uh, which form kind of a sliding clamp uh, on the single strand. And then that recruits a second uh, polymerase called polymerase epsilon, which is going to make long DNA. So now you have uh, your semi-discontinuous replication, the leading strand uh, is continuous, and then you have discontinuous on the other strand. So again, two polymerases, one for making primers and short DNAs, and then one for making uh, longer DNAs. And all this starts with large T antigen, right, coming in uh, to this area. RPA binds, someone asked, what does RPA do? RPA binds large T. It's recruited to the origin by large T. Large T is denaturing the origin. RPA binds the denatured DNA to keep it single-stranded. And then it brings in um, the primase. See, primase binds RPA as well as large T. So large T is still recruiting the cellular machinery. And then we simply make long DNA. This replication fork gets bigger uh, and bigger. You have your leading and lagging strands, and eventually you have to remove the uh, RNA primer. You have to fill in the gaps uh, and then ligate all the pieces together to make sure that there are no uh, non-covalent bonds there. And this goes around the whole circle. And this is the machine that does it all, just amazing machine. We have, here's one replication fork, and there's our hexamer of large T. We have a, a primase making the green RNA primer and then the DNA, the new DNA, short DNA there. Uh, there's more RNA primer. So that's the lagging strand. And this is the leading strand here. And there we have polymerase epsilon making long DNA uh, together with these other proteins. And this is, a, I call it a sliding clamp because it's clamped around the DNA and it moves down it. And this happens, of course, really, really quickly. Uh, now, when you get to the end, or even before you get to the end, that's when uh, enzymes called topoisomerases come into play. So here we have our original covalently closed circular template, right? You undergo DNA replication. We're unwinding the duplex and then we're making uh, new strands, right? As you unwind this and it gets bigger, the rest of the molecule gets overwound, right? Because this is a circle. We're separating the two strands. And as we make new DNA, the rest of the molecule gets twisted. And it eventually DNA synthesis would come to a halt if we didn't relieve this torsion. And that's the function of topoisomerase is one of them. Either one or two, there are two of them in the cell, cleaves one of the strands. And it's kind of like a, an elastic band that you've wound up. You cut it and boom, <laughs> it all straightens up. Uh, and then... You have now what we call relaxed supercoils and the DNA synthesis can continue. And of course, uh, that just, just one strand is enough to do that and it's ligated back together. Uh, 
And so this happens multiple times because if, as you keep denaturing, you, you twist it up again. Okay, now at the end, you have two daughter strands, but they're not going anywhere. They're, they're all intertwined, right? They're like two circles linked here. So to get them separated, you need topor isomerase two, which cuts both strands now. And that allows the two circles to be uh, separated. And of course, they'll be ligated together because you don't want any double-stranded breaks. So two, two topoisomerases, these are cellular enzymes that are needed in order to uh, separate the two strands at the end and also during synthesis to the relax these uh, overwound regions. The SV40 genome is a circular double-stranded DNA, which statement is correct. It's correct this time. A, T antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. B, replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. C, the five prime end problem is solved. Uh, D, has leading and lagging strand synthesis. E, all of the above. Okay, what do we have here? Most of you got all the above, which is correct. All these things are right. All right, so now let's move to another virus with a different solution, the parvoviruses, and we're going to see how DNA priming works. And here we have this uh, unusual single-stranded DNA, which is in the virus particle right there on the upper left. It has a single-stranded genome for most of it, but the ends are folded into what are called terminal repeats. And both ends are terminally repeated, and that works as shown at the bottom. Here's the nucleotide sequence. So we have the genome, and it turns out it is self-complementary. So it can base pair with itself in this way to form a T-structure. And that's the terminal repeat. So it's an inverted terminal repeat. And they're present at both ends. because That's the repeat part. So this genome encodes a couple of proteins. Um, there's a, a rep ORF. And then there's the capsid ORF, the single capsid protein that build the particle. And then a single protein that's processed to give a different, or I should say, uh, several proteins involved in uh, DNA synthesis. So how does this work? So the DNA, again, goes into the nucleus. And here we, we show it at the top. And here's the terminal repeat. Uh, it's inverted, which means, right, it's going in opposite directions. A, B, C, A prime, D, A, B, A prime, B prime, C prime, A, D. And the prime simply means it's complementary. So A prime is complementary to A, would base pair with A. All right, so it's inverted and it, it's formed in such a way that it can make these hairpins, all right, which you see right there. But it's stretched out so you can see how that's made. Um, as this gets in the cell nucleus, the um, um, cell recognizes this is, as uh, damaged DNA. It's the, the cell does not appreciate single-stranded DNA, so it repairs it. Polymerase delta will uh, use the three-prime end of that left terminal repeat as a primer and simply makes it double-stranded. And so that is DNA-primed synthesis, right? Because the primer is this three-prime hydroxyl, which I showed you in this slide. And this is a beautiful primer for a DNA polymerase, and it's a DNA primer. So the host cell does that, so you now have a double-stranded DNA. So that's done by the host cell, but you still need a viral protein. And so that's where this viral protein, which is encoded in the left part of the genome, comes into play. It's called REP78-68, REP meaning replication. So now you know the function of the hairpin here at the left is to be the primer for DNA synthesis. This protein is an origin binding protein. It binds to the origin at the left end and it nicks the DNA because this uh, intermediate molecule between after step two, it's all covalently closed. There's no way that a Polymerase can do any more with it. So the REP7868 origin binding protein binds to the left hairpin. It nicks it. It's an endonuclease. So now you have a three prime N, uh, which the cell can elongate from. And the first elongation, so there's at D, the three prime N. So the polymerase will go from right to left. Very short stretch there, elongating and copying the terminal repeat. So now you have a fully double-stranded molecule with uh, two terminal repeats, inverted terminal repeats, right? And then 
uh, these ends are denatured, they form hairpins. And now we have, as you can see here, displacement synthesis. There is, when, when you denature these hairpins, the bottom strand in red, there's now a three prime hydroxyl, which is open. The polymerase, again, the cell polymerase will uh, start priming there. It will displace the top strand. As you can see here, it's being pushed off. Uh, there's the top strand. And now we have this uh, double-stranded molecule, which looks exactly like the one from step two, where we began this whole thing. And so it goes through the whole process again. And this, dis this displaced genomic DNA will go through the same process as well. And you'll end up copying over and over. And again, there's no end problem here because we are priming with this hairpin. And then in this step, we're restoring the hairpin sequence here so we don't lose anything. That little extra copying there before the, the displacement ensures that the hairpin is restored. So it's continuous replication. There's no discontinuous replication because it's only displacement in one direction. As I said, the, the, the ITR is the primer. The viral proteins are needed for uh, clipping and making this this uh, three prime end so that we can get more synthesis made. And that rep protein also binds the origin. So there's no replication fork. It's all by strand displacement. So again, in contrast, the SV40, of course, was a replication fork, but this has an end, so we do strand displacement. And again, one viral protein and the rest done by the cell. So let's get a little more complicated. Let's try adenovirus now. So we're going from you know, 4,000, so base pairs to 35,000. So remember, these are icosahedral particles with a linear double-stranded DNA genome inside of them. And there's an origin of replication at both ends. There's an inverted terminal repeat, very much like the parvoviruses at both ends. And there's also a small protein linked to the Fry prime uh, end of each DNA strand called TP or terminal protein. So origins at both ends. And this is going to be reproduced also by strand displacement, uh, very much like um, parvoviruses that we just talked about. So let's see how that works. The first step is what's the primer? And you might guess it's the protein because that's what's on the five prime end of the each end of the genome. And it is. And here in these boxes, are illustrated the various steps in the protein priming of DNA synthesis. So here's one end of the, G, of the DNA where we're going to start initiation. And there is Paul is the viral DNA polymerase. It's a virus-encoded polymerase. And then PTP is the pre-terminal protein. It's a little bit longer than the terminal protein, which ends up on the viral DNA. So the polymerase binds to PTP, and adds a C to it. And the C base pairs with a G in the viral DNA near the three prime end. The polymerase then adds a couple of bases, CAT, and then it slips back because this GTA is repeated here. So the CAT can slip back. And then the polymerase starts to do uh, continuous synthesis. It leaves behind, of course, the PTP covalently linked to that first C. So the, the protein C is the primer. And because the slipback allows synthesis from the very end of the genome, so you don't lose any synthesis, there's no RNA primer to remove, the protein stays on, the, it's processed, and it becomes a little bit shorter, and that's what ends up in a capsid. So that's the priming step. Let's move to the main part here. So this polymerase is now going to do displacement synthesis. It's going to displace the top strand. And you can see in this step, it's moving down. We have some red new DNA made. The polymerase is pushing off the top strand. And as the top strand comes off, it is bound by a protein called DNA binding protein or DBP. And that's going to keep it in a single stranded form. Eventually, the top strand is all pushed off it comes down here in step four, and then you have a new strand, a new daughter strand, and you have a duplex made. And this can go through this synthesis over and over because the ends uh, will be primed 
the lower strand will be primed just as it has been in step one. The top strand is down here. It's coated in DBP. And by virtue of the fact that the ends are inverted terminal repeats, they're going to base pair and form a little double-stranded structure, which to the polymerase looks just like the ends of the viral DNA in the very beginning. All right, so that is brilliant because now the polymerase will come in and start to copy it. Even though it's not a full double-stranded genome, it's got the ends that look like an origin. The polymerase will bind. Uh, it will synthesize a copy. It will displace the um, DNA binding protein. And now you have the other daughter strand. So we have semi-discontinuous synthesis. Both strands have been copied. The original blue and light blue, now we have uh, red and salmon. So protein priming, no end problem as a consequence because we start right at the end here, uh, strand displacement. Here's a, a nice view of this DNA binding protein just to show so give you some insight into how it works. Here's the three-dimensional structure of the DNA binding protein. It's got a, a body, and then there's this extended part of the protein, kind of like a plow. And, you know, these, these molecules bind to the single-strand DNA as the polymerase is displacing it, and they probably help denature uh, the double-stranded DNA by that plow inserting into the duplex. The next question is, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? A, they both require protein-linked primers. B, replication occurs by strand displacement. C, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. D, a replication fork occurs in both. E, none of the above. So how are they similar? All right, we seem to be stuck at 25, so let's see. So the answer is B, replication occurs by strand displacement. That's what's common between parvo and adeno. They don't both require a protein link. That parvo was a DNA primer, the hairpin, not in the cytoplasm, in the nucleus, uh, no replication fork. They're both strand displacement. So it's either one or the other, and none of the above is not correct. Herpes simplex virus, we're getting bigger and we encode more replication proteins. Remember, this was an envelope virus with its nuclear capsid inside double-stranded DNA inside the, the nuclear capsid. And the DNA is a double-stranded linear molecule, very much like adenovirus, except longer, as you can see here. And it has multiple origins of replication and encodes um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven proteins for DNA synthesis, uh, primases, three primases, processivity protein, an origin binding protein, single-stranded DNA binding protein, much like the, DNA, the, the adenovirus DNA binding protein, and then this one is encoding the DNA polymerase. So uh, this, this is unusual because it, it illustrates for us a different kind of, of replication, which is the rolling circle replication. And that's why I'm I'm showing it to you. Otherwise, if it were the same as adenovirus, I wouldn't show it to you. But there's no protein linked at the ends. So we must have a different solution to the end problem. So uh, the DNA is injected into the nucleus. Remember the virus, the nuclear capsid docks onto the portal, uh, docks onto the nuclear pore by its one portal. The DNA shoots out of the capsid into the nucleus, and then it's circularized by a DNA ligase of the cell, DNA ligase 4, it joins the ends. Now you have a circle of DNA. And the next step is to reproduce this. How do you reproduce it? Well, if you were SV40, you could do bidirectional replication fork starting from an origin, right? But that's not how it works. It's by a different mechanism entirely, <laughs> which is rolling circle replication. So we have a covalently closed circle, and it has to be nicked. It's nicked by an endonuclease, which gives you a three-prime hydroxyl. You always need a three-prime hydroxyl, and that can be used as a primer to start DNA synthesis. So now the polymerase, the viral DNA polymerase, starts to copy the uh, one strand here. The, the red is the newly synthesized DNA. Uh, the other strand is displaced, and you have to imagine that 
As this red part goes longer, the blue is displaced. And the more the red goes, eventually, you know, the, its three prime end will come around here and be put off. And then as this uh, top strand is displaced, DNA synthesis can occur on it in a discontinuous fashion. It can only go five to three prime. It can't go continuous in the other way. That's the wrong direction. So you have discontinuous DNA synthesis. Eventually, you actually, this keeps going and you make many genome lengths and they get cut as they're packaged into the particle, as we will see later. But here are two genome lengths, and there's no end problem because the this is all, you can remove an RNA primer and just fill it in from the previous DNA. You can keep doing that. I suppose the very last one would have an end problem, but you'd make many, many, many uh, copies before you got to that very last one. So the end problem is solved in this case by this rolling circle mechanism where you make very long concatomers, we call them, many genomes copied together, and um, the replication occurs on that. So the question is, what did DNA ligase 4 do? The, the DNA ligase takes the herpes double-stranded linear DNA and makes a circle out of it. So in the virus particle, as you can see in the upper left, the DNA is linear. And when the DNA comes in the cell, it's circularized by DNA ligase 4, and then it does this rolling circle replication. A concatomer is many genomes all linked together, right? If this keeps going, you can think of it as a roll of toilet paper. It keeps unwinding and more and more come off, and each sheet of toilet paper is a genome, okay? That's a concatomer. Next time you go to the toilet, you're going to remember this because <laughs> toilet paper is a concatomer of single sheets, I'm sorry if that's offensive, but it's a good way to look at it because you just pull the, the sheets off. Of course, if you get two-ply toilet paper, then it's perfect. You have two strands, right? All right, our last uh, virus example is pox virus. A couple of unique aspects for this one. And one of them is that these reproduce in the cytoplasm. They are independent of the nuclear bureaucracy. They have nothing to do with the nucleus. The particle gets in and sets up shop in the cytoplasm. And so it's got to encode all the proteins it needs for DNA replication. So here is an experiment where we have infected a cell with a pox virus. And we have stained the infected cell in two ways. One with um, uh, DAPI, which will stain DNA blue. And you can see here this very blue staining structure. That's the nucleus of the cell. Uh, but you also see in the cytoplasm, there's some staining going on there, right? In particular, there's some round areas. So what's that? So the next panel, we stain with an antibody to the viral DNA binding protein. And that is in red. And so you can see that is in the cytoplasm, these little foci. And if you merge the two colors, then you can see that in the cytoplasm, we have both viral DNA binding protein and DNA. It's probably viral DNA. So those are the uh, cytoplasmic replication factories that the virus establishes. And you can see there's no, there's no um, viral DNA binding protein in the nucleus. Nothing happens in the nucleus. The NIC is done uh, by a cellular endonuclease for herpes virus. So here's how pox virus DNA replication occurs. This, this virus encodes at least 15 viral proteins. We're not actually sure of all of them, at least 15, and then the cell has to provide some. So this is a lot. Um, we start with the genome. Remember, the genome is a base-paired circle. You can look at it. It's one strand, but it's base-paired. The ends are joins. And the DNA begins at, replication begins at one end, uh, by the synthesis of RNA primers and then continuous DNA replication. You end up making a dimer, which then has to s resolve into two monomers. And how that happens, we're not sure. How the DNA becomes denatured to allow this to occur, we don't know. We just know that in the end, we get two monomers made. They somehow separate. There might be some topoisomerase cleavage. We don't know. But I just wanted to show you that First of all, this is cytoplasmic, and uh, it is it solves the end problem because there's no end. This is essentially a circle, just like SV40. Now, we've talked a lot about 
viral origins of replication. That's where replication begins. Talked about the, the single ORI of SV40, for example, at either end of adenovirus, three ORIs for herpes, one ORI at, at the left end for the parvoviruses. And these have a few features in common. They're AT-rich segments. They're recognized by viral origin recognition proteins, a way of starting the DNA synthesis there. And we've talked about the mechanisms. There are assembly points for these multi-protein replication machines. And some genomes have one, others have three. Our chromosomes have many right, origins because if we had only one per chromosome, our DNA would never uh, be replicated in time. Here are some closer looks at origins. I've already shown you the SV40 origin with these large T binding sites, the AT rich regions. They all have AT rich regions, right? They have areas that can be easily denatured so you can get DNA synthesis going. So here's the herpes, ORI L, one of the three ORIs. You know, it has sequences bound by the herpes origin binding protein. They're repeated just like the SV40 have an AT-rich region. And then the adenovirus uh, origin, which is at either end of the genome, of course. It's the end of the DNA that the, that is bound by the polymerase and the terminal protein. Uh, we have uh, or that yellow is where the uh, origin binding protein binds. Then we have AT-rich regions, so it can be easily denatured in this case so that the strand displacement can occur. The other feature that I haven't told you about is that these origins, these viral origins, often have binding sites for transcriptional regulators because they're often promoters in these regions as well. Um, here, uh, right next to the SV40 origin, there is the, which is not shown here, but it's a promoter. And there, these are the SP1 binding sites from that promoter. Here's an enhancer for it. The uh, ORI L of herpes is flanked by two different promoters. You can see here by the, the red arrows. So and the, and it's also the case for adenovirus, which is not shown here. So these these are um, binding sites for transcriptional regulators, NF1 and OCT1. So these are concentrated areas of regulation, both at DNA and for transcription. Recognition proteins are again the proteins encoded by the virus that bind the origin. This is really a key feature because it gets replication going. And especially for the small genome where you have to recruit the cell cellular apparatus. And we've talked about large T of polyomaviruses, which binds the origin. The parvovirus Rep6878 binds the origin at the left end. And, and um, remember, when this is double-stranded, that same protein nicks it to provide a primer. For adenovirus, the um, origin-binding protein is the p terminal protein, the PTP, which binds the end and recruits the DNA polymerase to add a C to it and start um, the priming reaction. Uh, so that's shown right there. And then for herpes virus, um, th we haven't talked about the origins, but it, it, it encodes origin binding proteins, that's, which is the UL9 protein. And that helps to uh, recruit other proteins there and unwinds it to get, it, to get DNA synthesis going. And so these genomes have features in common. Missing here is, is the pox virus because the details are simply not known. These origin binding proteins are structurally very similar. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. So we have here a parvovirus uh, origin binding protein, a bovine papillomavirus one, and then the SV40T antigen. <clears throat> you can see just by looking at the, the alpha carbon traces that the structures are similar. We have this uh, beta sheet, which is architecturally very similar in both and a series of alpha helices laid around them. Uh, and these are very good at binding DNA. Now the AAV protein, the Rep6878, has an extra feature. It has a, a, a cleft here, which is the active site of the endonuclease, which is needed to nick uh, the DNA to provide a primer and, and so that you can eventually uh, separate the strands, which is what terminal resolution is. So someone is asking if BT the same, is big T the same as LT? Yeah, large T, LT, and that's just because there's also a small T, which I haven't talked about. I'm not going to talk about, but LT, large T, T antigen.
Here's SV40, large T. This has been called the most studied protein on earth. I mean, people have worked on this many laboratories for many, many, many years and have dissected every single amino acid. And um, nobody does this, or very few people do this because it's very hard to get funding for this kind of basic research, but this is really what enables us to do a lot of the things we do today. So here's large T, 708 amino acids, and has all kinds of domains in it. Here's the uh, origin binding domain. It's a very specific part of large T that binds the origin. But we also have parts that bind Paul alpha. You can see one here and one here. It's the, the ATPase part, which is the energy gener uh, hy hydrolysis part, ATP hydrolysis part that's needed for the unwinding. Here's the helicase activity, single-stranded DNA binding. There's a nuclear localization signal or sequence. And then there is this part labeled RB. That's retinoblastoma, retinoblastoma protein binding site. And what that means is going to be uh, become clear in a moment. This is actually a T for different polyomaviruses is a species specific DNA and origin binding protein. And the virus will only reproduce in the right species. So you can have polyomaviruses of monkeys in which, or primates, in which case the virus will only reproduce in primates. There are murine polyomaviruses where the virus, the, the murine virus will not reproduce in primates and vice versa. And much of that restriction, host range, is due to uh, the T antigen these pre-initiation complexes where the T antigen is binding the origin. They don't form in the wrong species. And as a consequence, you cannot recruit uh, Paul alpha primase to the template. So the DNA never replicates. Uh, large C also binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators and cause cells to get into S phase. So what's that about? Let's talk about that now. And that's going to involve this little piece of large C that binds RB. Most of your cells in your body do not divide or they do so rarely. Of course, the extreme are your neurons, which don't divide. And then the other extreme are your gastrointestinal epithelia, which turn over every seven days or so. But in between, um, most of our cells are not dividing unless you need them to divide. If you are exercising and building up muscle, then your cells have to divide. But if you're sitting, studying, you don't need much cell division. And that's a problem for viruses because they do not re reproduce well, or many of them do not reproduce well in quiescent cells. Why? <laughs> because if a cell is not dividing, it's not making DNA, and there's, there's no DNA machinery, reproduction machinery available for reproducing viral genomes. Makes perfect sense. So when a virus infects a cell, of course, uh, a virus will infect any kind of a cell, whether it's dividing or not. And if it's not dividing, the virus must somehow produce a protein that kicks the cell into dividing. So it has to induce host replication proteins, get the cells dividing. And this is done by viral early gene products. And we've already talked about some of those before, but now we're going to see uh, how they work. Now, to do this, we have to talk about the cell cycle a bit, right? We have a roughly 24-hour cell cycle where we have a G1 period, which is a period of cell growth. The cell is just divided. It's getting bigger now. We have a S period where DNA replication occurs. And we have G2, which happens just before mitosis or cell division. And of course, during mitosis, the cell divides into two, and each cell gets an equal complement of, of DNA, of course. So everything is leading up to that. Now you have two cells, and then they go through G1 again. There is There are actually several checkpoints in this cell cycle so that it doesn't go on all the time. And one of them is right here. It's a restriction point called uh, the R, which is controlled by the RB protein, retinoblastoma protein, which is encoded by this cellular retinoblastoma gene. This controls entry into S. 
this protein decides whether the cell is going to go into S and the, the signals that lead to that we'll, we'll get to uh, in a moment and we'll get to and we'll discuss even more next time. Um, so RB controls entry into S and it was discovered because uh, young children uh, have retinoblastomas, tumors of the retina. Uh, early in life, they develop these. And these kids uh, have a loss of the gene encoding RB. And so the, uh, the, the loss of the gene is associated with tumor formation. Therefore, we have called this a tumor suppressor gene. So its presence is needed to avoid these tumors. And the reason is because it keeps cells from dividing forever. And that's what leads to cancers. When cells start to divide forever uncontrolled, then they become cancerous uh, by mechanisms, which we'll talk about in a couple of lectures. All right, so what does this have to do with viruses? Well, these immediate early proteins or these early viral proteins abrogate RB. And we've talked about this before in the context of adenovirus E1A. So here um, is these, these pink guys here are these early proteins of viruses, SV40 large T, uh, the papillomavirus has an equivalent, uh, and then there's the E1A protein of adenovirus. And these proteins bind and sequester RB. Now, I told you last time that um, the, the adenovirus early transcription requires E2F proteins. These are transcription regulators normally bound up by RB and so not available for viral transcription. When RB is bound to E2F and E2F sits on a, a DNA near a promoter, the RB recruits histone deacetylases and that tightens up the DNA so it can't be transcribed. So RB is shutting off E2F controlled promoters. And those promoters, by the way, control genes uh, that are needed for cell division and DNA synthesis. So the cell control is mediated by RB sitting on these promoters. And that's how it works as a checkpoint. So again, these are genes encoding uh, replication proteins of the cell that allow the cell to synthesize DNA and to divide, go through mitosis. Viral promoters, like for adenovirus early promoter, its replication proteins, which are encoded in the early region, are also controlled by E2F responsive promoters. And so that's how the checkpoint uh, in the cell cycle works. RB sits on these promoters until the conditions are right that cells can divide. And those conditions include having adequate nutrients in the cells and so forth. Now, these viruses need to get the cells to divide. So they encode these early proteins that sequester RB, they pull it off E2F, and now these promoters are active. The cells begin to make proteins that are needed for cell division and DNA synthesis, and there are many of those. But that's how the viruses, when they get into a cell, can ensure that the cell is dividing. They have their early proteins bind uh, RB. So these proteins have a lot of functions. In large T already, you see... It's involved in viral DNA synthesis, and it's also abrogating RB so that there are available enzymes for viral DNA replication. So, so to summarize this, the viral early proteins abrogate RB so there's no more checkpoint on the cell cycle. Now that the restriction point is gone, the cells can divide on and on and on and on. But of course, eventually they'll die because the virus reproduction will kill them. So they won't divide forever. And so that's how the viruses get the cells to enter mitosis if they're not already and produce the proteins that they require for DNA synthesis. It's all at the level of RB. Uh, here you see the cell actually, if it's not virus infected, there are obviously some conditions where um, the cell has to divide and re remove the RB checkpoint. And that's done by phosphorylation by cell, cell cycle specific kinases. Right, so there are some conditions where you have to divide, and that's how we do this in the absence of a viral early protein. Someone's asking, what does DP do? It's, not, it's simply another uh, part of this uh, transcription protein, um, which is binding to the promoter, uh, the, the exact function I'm not sure of, but it's always present in the E2F complex.
but RB binds E2F, not DP. And DP uh, alone, um, it, it's removing RB from this equation that's important because E2F DP is the active complex. That is uh, our discussion of DNA synthesis. We're actually going to come back to it because this idea that viral proteins can kick cells into dividing has consequences for cell transformation and tumor formation. Next time, we're going to get into a discussion of reverse transcription and integration. And that's the process by which uh, retroviruses and other viruses make uh, DNA copies of their RNAs. Mm -hmm.